Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm here to tell you a couple of things about HTTP2, which is the uh, latest incarnation of ubiquitous HTTP protocol, and to see what, really, what it really brings to, to the developers. Uh, OK, so let's first take a look a bit at the hi uh, history of HTTP. Uh, as you can see, HTTP2 was introduced in uh, 2015. Actually, the standard was published in, in May, so just recently. And the last version was published in 1999, so uh, it's 16 years since the last update. HTTP 1.1 was actually the first proper, proper uh, specification of the, uh, of the protocol. And then uh, not much happened with regard to standard in the next 16 years, and obviously the, the web development and web itself was changed quite a lot. So Google introduced their own experimental speedy protocol in 2009, uh, which brought a lot of performance improvements and Speedy served as, as the really uh, uh, input for uh, HTTP2. Actually, it served so much that uh, HTTP2 actually is almost the same as Speedy without some minor things which were removed, removed because they were quite controversial. So what are really the goals of the HTTP2? Actually, there is just one goal. And that's performance. So there is no new semantics. Uh, you still have all the same verbs, all the same headers. Nothing really changed in that application part of the protocol. Uh, all the changes were done really in the transport part of, of the protocol uh, um, in order to, to improve the, the latency and, uh, let's say, speed of, of the applications. The reason for this is that the pages grew quite a lot. For example, just in the last five years, average page uh, was tripled in size, and it grew to, grew to more than 100 requests per page. To understand why this is a problem, let's take a look at this picture. This is a typical, typical uh, request uh, when you do the first connection to, to, uh, to a web page. In this example, you can see that it takes almost 700 milliseconds, but the important part the one that you care about is really just this green part, uh, which takes less than one third of, of the request. Everything else is really the overhead. So you have first the DNS lookup, and this one was uh, really taken from the cache, so it was fast. Then you have a, a TCP handshake, then you have SSL handshake, and you end up really with just a small part uh, 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 of, of this time uh, uh, dedicated to, to the stuff you, you care about. Uh, this is even more problem with mobile devices, which suffer uh, much more from, from uh, latency issues. Uh, so it's even more visible today when you have multiple mobile devices connecting to your, to your website. Um, HTTP 1.1 already tried to solve these issues. Uh, for example, you can see that on the left, in HTTP 1.0, uh, each request, even on same host, was a separate connection, which was created and closed again. And each of these connections incurred the same penalty with regard to, to, to latency. Then 1.1 uh, tried to fix this by introducing persi uh, persistent connections, uh, which uh, use the same connection to execute all the, all the requests, but uh, they still have to be executed sequentially. Uh, so additional feature which was introduced was uh, pipelining. Uh, the idea was that you could fire off a couple of requests and get, uh, get uh, the responses uh, later on, but you don't have to wait between, between uh, each uh, response. However, this, in the end, this failed because um, uh, HTTP requires that you return responses in the same order uh, as uh, requests. And it's very hard for a uh, for server to know how to reorder these uh, responses, so a lot of servers don't, didn't implement it. A lot of equipment in the middle, like routers, uh, switches, and everything, didn't know how to cope with, with these requirements. So in the end, I think none of the browsers really use pipelining by default. So it, it failed, unfortunately. And then the developers came with their own solutions, which actually more of hacks, like domain sh uh, sharding, spriting, and stuff like that. And on top of that, browser implementers decided to use multiple concurrent uh, uh, connections to, to fetch uh, data in parallel. This put even more pressure to the network infrastructure with uh, increased uh, packet loss and stuff like that. So uh, this was really not the proper solution, and HTTP 2 tries to address this first with uh, probably the biggest change, uh, that it is really a binary protocol. So you, you will not be able to really 
tell it into your server and see what's coming back, you will need some tool like, like Wireshark or stuff like that uh, to see the data. Uh, on the left side, you can see a typical one-to-one -one request with, with everything you need. Uh, and on the right side uh, is HTTP2 uh, request where you can really just blocks or frames of binary data which are shipped over the, over the connection to you. Uh, this is structured in, in, in the following way. So you, you, now you will not have multiple parallel connections, so we have just one connection. But you have streams which are kind of, of logical abstraction over the, over the one request. And these streams uh, uh, exchange uh, blocks which are called frames uh, to move data from client to server and uh, back again. For example, you can see that request uh, really, uh, when browser requests a page, it sends a headers frame, which contains request headers. Then uh, it sends some data uh, frame with, with payload. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, server response with uh, response headers frame and also response uh, data, which are really just binary binary uh, packets uh, which are sent. Uh, so the same connection will then be used for the next uh, stream and the next stream and so on. And even more important is that uh, streams are really multiplexed over the connection. So you will not have to wait uh, or use it like in pipelining, uh, but instead multiple streams, uh, frames from the multiple streams can be interleaved on the connection both ways to the server and back, uh, back to the client. Here you can see, for example, uh, each color really represents different resource and the frames are really interleaved so you can have multiple uh, stuff uh, going in, in parallel. Let's see how that affects the behavior. Uh, here you can see the anatomy of typical 1.1 requests and you can see first we try to fetch uh, here. We create a new connection to get the, the main page and then uh, later on to fetch additional resources uh, we have created another five connections because Chrome uses like six connections, then these connections are used to fetch the resources. When they are done, they are reused to fetch another resources and so on. Uh, if you look at this, it takes more than five seconds for this particular page. And now the same page served with uh, HTTP2. It also has a setup for the connection, but then later on you can see that the same connection is reused and most of these streams are uh, being downloaded in, in parallel. And the effect of this is that uh, time to, to load the pages is shortened from more than five seconds into 1.29 seconds for this example. Obviously, this is really to show the best case. In practice, you will not have such uh, benefits because you have also links to other resources, you have uh, another, other connections to CDN to whatever, but this is really showing the, the, the main, main point of, uh, of, of using HTTP2. We haven't mentioned how do we actually connect, and it really depends on whether we are using HTTP or HTTPS endpoint. For HTTP, uh, we use protocol upgrade feature of 1.1, uh, where you send a normal HTTP 1.1 uh, request, but you also send upgrade headers with some additional data. And server, if it doesn't understand uh, HTTP 2, it will just respond normally with 200 or 400 something or whatever. But if it does understand HTTP 2, it will return a response uh, status 101, switching protocols, um, and immediately continue to deliver HTTP 2 data. So we don't have to do another round trip to the server uh, to start communicating uh, with, with the new protocol. For HTTPS, uh, it's a bit different. Uh, the new extension for TLS was developed. It's called Application Layer uh, Protocol Negotiation, where during the TLS handshake, a client sends a list of preferred protocols to the server, and then server can reply with its own preferences, and they can agree on uh, which protocol to use. So again, you don't have additional round trip to, to, to switch to HTTP2. What's, what's important is that major browser vendors have declared that they will only uh, support HTTP2 for TLS connections except Internet Explorer, I think. So you will be forced to, to use uh, TLS on your site if you want to, to move to HTTP2. There are some additional inter interests, for example, why Google wants to push this, but okay, it's, it was a bit controversial. Uh, it was proposed also for the protocol, but uh, the committee decided not to, not to enforce, uh, enforce this. Uh, next feature is header compression. Um, 
headers are becoming more and more of, uh, an issue in 1.1 because they are not compressed and they can grow quite large. Typically now they contain hundreds of bytes and they can really grow to kilobytes due to cookies. And uh, to, to address this issue, a uh, new HPEC compression algorithm was defined for HTTP2 where you have, uh, you have really tables of, of already seen headers on both sides of connection and then um, Connecting parties uh, are not sending uh, the values which are already known to the other side. And the ones which are not known, they are uh, Huffman encoded, so they are uh, really reduced. So in best case, when you have, for example, two requests with same headers, um, I think that header can get shrunk to like eight bytes or something like that. Uh, however, this was quite controversial because this means that, that header handling is now stateful, which means that server for each connection has to keep a list of these uh, of these headers, and some people see this as a vector for uh, denial of service attacks. On the other hand, you will probably not use that many parallel connections from the browsers, so you alleviate this, this issue a bit. So it's, I think we will have to, we will have to see uh, how it plays in the end. There is also a prioritization of the streams. Uh, that's quite interesting feature, although I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about it. Uh, you can use uh, special frames called priority frames in the message where you specify dependency between two streams uh, and also the weight of, of each stream. So, uh, for example, uh, you can specify the stream 2 is uh, dependent on stream 1. This means uh, that server will then uh, first ensure that stream 1 is completely sent to the, to the browser and only then it will start to send um, the stream 2. This uh, this means that this multiplexing will not happen for these two streams, but sometimes you need this, and uh, it can be useful in some scenarios. Additionally, there is a weight. Weight is actually what, what's, what makes me skeptical. Uh, for example, you can see that stream 3 and stream 4 have weight 4 and weight 8 uh, uh, assigned to them. Uh, this is a suggestion to the server, which can ignore it, uh, to give uh, twice as many resources to the uh, stream 4 then to the stream three. Uh, it's a huge question, how can you implement uh, something on the server to give one resource twice as many resources? How do you ensure that you have twice as many CPU, memory and stuff? It's, it's actually very, very complex to, to, to implement something like that, so I'm skeptical at how it will really be used. Maybe there will be some features which can benefit from it, but I believe that mostly this will be unused because ju just imagine how would you implement similar feature to, to and, and what is really a resource in that sense? Is it a CPU, is it I.O., is it memory, is it whatever? So I'm not really sure how much that will be used, but the next one will probably be. And this is a server push, uh, and the idea behind that is that when you send a request to the server, server already probably knows what other resources you might want to have. And uh, it can push it to you without re uh, requiring another round trip to the, to the server. So here you can see that, for example, when we request index HTML page, we get headers and data. Uh, server then responds, responds not with the headers initially, but with a push promise frame for style sheet of, of this page. So it, it goes even before the uh, index HTML headers uh, so that you avoid situation that browser reads the, the headers and starts to read the data and downloads uh, the style sheet. This way, the server pushes uh, this promise to the, to the, to the browser, uh, typically to the cache, and then uh, it sta uh, starts to send both uh, frames for index HTML and also for the sty style sheet. The idea is that server will be able to, to uh, push changes into, into your cache or to invalidate cache and you will avoid round trips for, for, for these resources, which will make it uh, more, more responsive. Um, this will probably be quite useful for many features because typically server will be able to, to find out what is, what is um, the best approach to, to, to push things. Of course, sometimes you don't want this, so a browser can send the reset stream uh, header back to the server, and then this push will be rejected. So there is some control over the, over the communication and, and push packets. Uh, next question is, as you can see, uh, 
All these features are really under, under the hub. You don't really see it when you're implementing a, a, an application. So what it really means to you, it really depends on what kind of, of work you are doing. If you are doing front-end front -end development, you are probably more on the left side because you don't really see that much and you will just continue to use, use it as is. If you do the backend stuff, then most likely you will be somewhere in the middle of, of this curve because it, uh, it will have some, some influence on how you do the stuff. Uh, for me personally, I'm more to the right side because in the last three years, working for, for different clients, I have seen at least four different implementation of TCP protocols which, which implement their own, uh, their own multiplexing, their own priorities and stuff like that. So people are reinventing the same thing on top of TCP all the time while with HTTP2 you get this out of the box. So if you can use some libraries which provide this to you, then you can remove all this custom development and debugging of, of your own custom solution. Uh, it's also important to note that all tricks like domain sharding and sprites and stuff can actually be uh, harmful uh, when you use HTTP2. And it brings up the question of how will you, how will you structure your application so for that for HTTP1, it serves all these, it does all these tricks, and for HTTP2, it, it doesn't. Probably a set of best practices will, will emerge, so we will see what, what, will, what will be the best way to, to, to do it in production. Uh, additional things that for APIs, it might be beneficial to use HTTP2 in the long term because due to the uh, smaller latencies, you can have more granular API. However, if you want to support both, both versions of protocol, you, don't, you can have two different APIs. So maybe it will happen when, when everybody switches to HTTP2 in 10 years or so. And of course, you have to, to take care to serve everything on top of TLS, which previously was not a requirement, because although protocol doesn't require that, all the major browsers will not be able to, to talk to your site. So you will have to, you will have to be you have to mind this. Uh, how is it supported on the server side? Uh, well, all the major servers should support it by the end of the year. Uh, Apache through mod uh, HTTP2, uh, IIS supports it already in Windows 10, allegedly, and Nginx, they claim they will support it by the end of the year. Um, for proxies, most of the proxies are working on it, with exception of Varnish. Uh, the guy behind the varnish is actually one of the biggest critics of the HTTP2 and is not really optimistic, enthusiastic actually about the protocol and he says that he will support it when it gets traction. Uh, what you also can use is ng-HTTP2, which is a very nice proxy uh, from HTTP2 to HTTP1.1, so can, you can put it in front of your site. People report some good experiences with it, I don't know, I haven't tried it, so I can tell. And for the CDNs, uh, Akamai uh, say they will also support it by the end of the year. Where Cloudflare, uh, uh, Cloudflare uh, depends on Nginx, so they will have it when Nginx, Nginx uh, uh, has it. Uh, so that's more, uh, more or less it, it should be supported by all, all the major vendors by the end of the year or in the next year. And since I have some time left, uh, Maybe just uh, to, to talk a bit more about these frames. Where is it? Nope. Okay, I will find it. Okay. Now, the frames are interesting because there are uh, 10 different types of frames uh, which allow you to do different things. So first, you have headers and data which just carry the, the payload of the requests. However, uh, we have also seen the push promise, which is used for, for push. Um, there is also a set of, of frames for uh, uh, flow control. So on top of a TCP flow control, you will also have HTTP uh, flow control when uh, different, uh, with bo both pa connected parties can uh, send their own uh, window update frames which specify how much data they can take. 
So uh, the communication can be, can be optimized, which should again reduce the number of, of, of uh, actually it should reduce the waiting for the data to be, to be processed. Um, also, during the initial uh, connection, uh, there are settings frames which are exchanged between, uh, between server and client. And in, in these frames, uh, both sides can specify their preferences. Like, uh, do they want to do uh, uh, push? Do they want to do uh, window updates and stuff like that? So you can really, uh, uh, browsers and clients, and clients can, can uh, really tweak their communication uh, uh, patterns to optimize for a specific, specific uh, specific use case. So this more or less covers the, the new features introduced in HTTP2 and feel free to ask any questions. Okay, so we have a lot of questions. There was Hi. Uh, can you tell me how, how does your application control the push promise and weights? Uh, do you use like headers or something like that? Uh, uh, you, when you say application, you mean web application, okay? Yes. Uh, at the moment, uh, there is no way to do it. That's why I said that uh, it will most likely not change much for, for the people. All these, uh, uh, all these changes are not really controllable by, by the application. Maybe there will be, in, in, I, I suppose actually that in some time there will be uh, APIs uh, uh, which will provide control over this, for example, like WebSockets introduced APIs for that. But at the moment it's completely at the mercy of, of your server, especially for push promise where client cannot do anything. It can just reject a push promise, but uh, a server decides whether, whether it will send it, or send it or not. So at the moment there is no control. If it gets traction, I would bet that there will be APIs in browsers, in applications where you can, where you can control it. Uh, browser can uh, use these priorities that we have seen, this dependency tree, to specify uh, what it wants to get first. So this can be used by, by, by the browser to control it, and probably browsers will have maybe APIs to control this. But at the moment, Actually, support in all servers and, and browsers is rather new, so there is not really much support for, for this. Uh, hi. Uh, you said that uh, this protocol introduced uh, compression of headers. Is there any uh, other uh, protocol feature that uh, will reduce uh, payload size? Um, actually, except uh, header compression, nothing changed. Uh, well, the content is, uh, is binary, which for typically for text will, will not change much, but it will reduce at least, you can send out more data without resorting to multiple mime parts and stuff like that, so it will reduce it slightly. But you can still use, uh, um, uh, for example, gzip encoding and stuff like that to compress your payload, so it will not go away. Uh, it doesn't have any new kind of compression. Um, as I said, all the old semantics from HTTP 1.1 uh, remains there, so you can use the compression which you have in 1.1, but only new compression is really uh, header compression. Hi. Oh, now it works. Um, just more remark on server uh, support. If you use JTA application server for Java, you actually can configure an XML file like. Uh, so you can you speak up a uh, little louder, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I will do my best, sorry. Um, so one remark on uh, server support. Mm -hmm. If you use JT application server for Java, mm -hmm. there is a way to uh, configure an XML file, which, are res which resources are mm -hmm. more important so for this service this, uh, promise. But whatever, I, I have another question. Um, so uh, HTTP2 is very useful for delivering assets. But whenever it comes to REST API, I mean, uh, the whole point of REST is being stateless, right? Mm -hmm. And you usually like have load balancer, round robin, and this kind of stuff. But HTTP2 introduces a state, right? First of all, it's headers, and second of all, it's like persistent, mm -hmm. bidirectional connection, which is like sticky session. So how do you do load balancing in a way to, to actually scale HTTP requests? So how, how would you do like round robin policy or something like that? Thanks. Mm, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood correctly. Uh, uh, how would you use uh, uh, features of HTTP2? You mean control it from the outside or? or? Well, it doesn't work. Um, I mean, is there 
any benefit of using HTTP2 for REST APIs. Uh -huh. And if there is, like how you would do like round robin scaling, uh, like load balancing of HTTP mm -hmm. requests with HTTP2? Well, uh, one benefit for sure is, is this reduced uh, uh, connection, uh, uh, connection latency. If, uh, because typically, uh, Browsers don't keep the connection open during uh, the whole lifetime of, of, of connection to the host between different resources. Uh, uh, in HTTP2, uh, you reuse the same connection uh, uh, during your whole communication with, with the server. So if you take it to the page where it's, where it's a bit more obvious, uh, when you open one page, you will lose this connection. Now you open the another uh, tab and use another page from the same host. You will not have a new connection. You will have the same connection. And only when you close all these pages, only then will connection be uh, closed. And there is a specific go away frame, which is used to tell a server that you don't really want to use this connection, so that it's, it's not used. So first of all, there will still be uh, um, less connections, depending on your clients, because clients also keep these connection, connections open. And uh, another benefit, as I said before, is that due to the, this later, uh, lower latency, y y in the future, you might be able to make your APIs more more uh, granular, because the less latency you have, the, the the more granular you can you can make it. But uh, with regard to to your other questions like this round robin stuff, I have no idea honestly. I don't know if you can really do much there at least for now.